Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Uh, welcome back to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown, creator, host, and uh, just regular Joe. Across the table from me, as per usual, is my good friend Matthew. Say hello, Matthew. Hello, Matthew. No, that's not what I... Anyway. <laughs> I, um, hmm. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate, Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Enimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. I've got the fever for the flavor of some dark poutine. Yes, you do. Yep. On February 4th, 1880, just past midnight, five members of the Donnelly family, a mother, a father, two sons, and a niece, were brutally murdered by a mob in their homes just outside of Lucan, Ontario, in Biddulph Township. This crime happened 142 years ago this month. It had its roots in the even more distant past, and its effects have echoed in Canada right up to today. The family and their story became legendary and often shock people into the realization of how dark and unforgiving early life in Canada could be. Numerous books, songs, TV shows, plays, and films have been made about the murders. There's even a craft beer brand in Ontario called the Black Donnelly's Brewing Company, whose bottles sport illustrations of the infamous family. If you grew up in Ontario, the massacre was actually a part of the school curriculum. This is a case of victim blaming on a huge scale. Myths and legends sprung up about the family, perhaps somewhat to appease the guilty conscience of society. Even up to the early 1980s, if you went to Lucan, people would say, we don't talk about the Donnellys. Now it's our turn to tell the story, and we hope the descendants of the Donnellys find that we do them some justice, because justice was never served in this case. You're listening to Dark Poutine, episode 208, The Donnelly Family Massacre. While the Donnelly Massacre is 142 years old, we're going to go a little bit further back than that, by about an additional 1155 years, to provide some context. Irish General and King Dongale O'Neill died in 867 CE. The O'Neills were a tribe that went back to ancient times. After the king died, his first name was taken up as a family name, and over time, many spellings led to the Donnelly spelling that we use today. The family did include some poets and musicians, but the family roots were a little more robust. From the book by Peter Edwards, Night Justice, The True Story of the Black Donnellys, quote, Most of all, however, the Donnellys were soldiers whose battle cry was Lam Durgabu, or On to Victory, and whose motto was Trium Dills, or Brave and Loyal. The Donnellys were the first clan in Northern Ireland to renounce paganism and adopt early Christianity but they continued to be independent thinkers and refused to accept without question either doctrines from the Pope in Rome or a rule from England, end quote. Now fast forward about 800 years to 1641. The book goes on to say, quote, In the Ulster Uprising in 1641, a Patrick O'Donnelly took back Castle Ballydonnelly from the armies of the parliamentarian Oliver Cromwell, who fought both the wide-reaching power of Charles I and his ties with Catholicism. 
What followed was a series of revolts that swept the whole of Ireland. As Protestant settlers were evicted from their lands, farms were torched, cattle stolen. In some cases, there were also massacres, provoking fears of an international popish conspiracy. This enraged Cromwell, a devout Protestant who led the English Civil War to overthrow Catholic King Charles I. He set himself up as leader of the British Isles and Lord Protector. In reality, he can be described as a regicidal maniac, a military dictator, an anti-monarchist, and seethingly anti-Catholic. He had King Charles beheaded in 1649. <laughs> Off with his head. Off with his head. Here's an interesting fact. Okay. There was a BBC poll in 2002. Yes. Where Cromwell was selected as one of the greatest Britons of all time. Do you know who he came after? No. He came in 10th after people like Charles Darwin, Shakespeare, Sir Isaac Newton, and drumroll, John Lennon. John Lennon. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Cromwell was, in, was an interesting character. I remember the movie Cromwell. Mm -hmm. It was Richard Harris okay. played Cromwell, and Alec Guinness, a.k.a. Yes. Obi-Wan Kenobi, was also in it. I think I saw that movie about... Two months ago. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I rewatched it probably around the same time. Okay. And I remember watching it for the first time in history class in school. Really? I don't know how close to history it actually was, but... You yeah, know. Well, yeah. Fascinating but, stuff. Yeah. The good that came out of the Cromwell era was that it was the start of primacy of parliament and the beginning of a constitutional monarchy where parliament had more power than the sovereign. It needed to be done, as no one wants to be led by the personal whims of any king or queen with actual power. Unfortunately, Cromwell was a right bastard in the way he went about doing it. Right bastard? Yeah. Uh, you know, when you look back, Mike, mm -hmm. it was, when we learned history when we were young, right? It was sort of like, you know, the dateline, right? But it, in reality, it's way, history is way less linear, way less cut and dried mm -hmm. than we think it is. And it's always much, much bloodier. <laughs> yes. And I was reading uh, recently about the beginnings of World War II and what led up to it. Yeah. And typically what we get is this really succinct, encapsulated, here's how things went. Yeah. But it's not quite as it's simple. It's flying in from everywhere, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, you know, stuff is going on. Yeah. History is often a lot bloodier than it's portrayed to be, even even the most bloody things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. After murdering the Catholic king, Cromwell attacked Ireland again. In 1650, the last Irish castle to fall was in Tipperary. Seven Donnelly brothers died attempting to defend it. After this, there were a few uprisings in 1690, but under King William of Orange... They were quashed. Again, from the book Night Justice, quote, To prevent further Catholic uprisings, a series of laws were passed with the intention of keeping the native Irish poor, powerless, and as ignorant as possible. Now Irish Catholics were barred from serving as officers in the army or navy or practicing as lawyers, and when a Catholic landowner died, his land was divided among all his sons unless the eldest son became a Protestant. If the eldest son was Protestant, he got everything, no matter what the wishes of his deceased father had been. Catholics were not allowed to own horses worth more than five pounds, couldn't live within five miles of an incorporated town, and couldn't attend or keep schools. It was a potent formula for ignorance and bitterness, which Edmund Burke, the 18th century philosopher and member of parliament, called a machine as well fitted for the oppression, impoverishment, and degradation of the people and the debasement of human nature itself as ever proceeded from the perverted ingenuity of man, end quote. This perversion carried on for years and years and years. Eventually, a resistance group called the White Boys, named because they wore white shirts over their clothes to identify each other, was formed. Men who at night would fight the English rule in Ireland, some people called them terrorists, others freedom fighters. Eventually, white boys turned into various factions, many fighting each other as well. Fights, night raids, arson, killing of livestock were all common occurrences in 17th century Ireland. The Protestants were fighting back, though, and at one time two Protestants shot into a funeral procession of Irish Catholic white boys. In that massacre, three men were killed, Two of them had last names that were Carol and Farrell, ancestors of the men who would feature prominently later in this story. Over time, another group came about, 
who were disdainfully called Blackfeet. These were Irish Catholics who were tired of the wars, who simply wanted to work hard, be friendly and trade with the Protestants and get on with life. They were called Blackfeet because they famously worked in coal mines owned by Protestants and their feet were black at the end of the day. In the late 1700s, private landowners stopped allowing Catholics grazing their land to eke out some sort of existence and began evicting people. This was a huge blow as they were already barely surviving. Rebellion started once again. This is the society that both James Donnelly and Johanna McGee were born into. James was born in 1816 and Joanna in 1820 in Tipperary to families living under notice to vacate rules, meaning they could be evicted from their homes at any time. They were both born into Blackfeet families. Therefore, the Donnellys were known as the Black Donnellys. They weren't black, nor were they from the First Nations Blackfeet tribe, in case you were wondering. In 1821, when James and Joanna were just children, one of the most infamous white boys' attacks took place. This attack became known as the Burning of the Shays, where 16 people were burned in their house when the white boys determined that the Shays had evicted too many Catholics from their land. James and Joanna grew up and eventually met, were married, and had their first son, James Jr., in 1842. Just before the Great Potato Famine in Ireland, they were getting by, but with a growing family, it was now not enough. They heard about other Irish who had moved to this new land called Upper Canada, with the promise of better treatment and opportunities to own land, to have the ability to vote, and most importantly, not to starve to death. They scraped together what they needed to get there and set sail. They were in many ways refugees, not much unlike those we see coming to Canada from Syria or Afghanistan today. Upper Canada, the Donnelly family's destination, is what we call Ontario today. But for thousands of years before Europeans took over the land and before Bidolph County, where the Donnellys moved to, and long before the land was ceded to Britain in 1825, that's just 17 years before the Donnellys arrived, it was the land of the Chippewa, also known as the Ojibwe, Ojibwa, or Salto, who are part of a larger group of culturally related indigenous peoples present in the Great Lakes region of Canada and the United States called the Anishinaabe. Soon after the Chippewa were moved onto reserves, we call them reserves in Canada versus reservations in the USA, in nearby Kettle Point and Walpole Island. It was settled by, not many people know this, former black slaves from America. In the 1830s, the area was first settled by the Wilberforce settlers. The Wilberforce colony was a community created to aid freed refugee slaves from the United States. The Cromwellian crap that was happening to the Irish was happening in a similar way to freed black slaves in America, specifically Cincinnati. Just like in Ireland, there were draconian laws to make life for black people as difficult as possible, things like being required to produce certificates of freedom and posting $500 bond, needing two white men to sign a document to guarantee their good behavior, they weren't allowed to vote, to hold office, couldn't attend school or testify against a white person, no matter the circumstances. They weren't allowed in juries, and if on trial their fate was up to a group, usually racist, of white male jurors, they wanted a better life, obviously. The then Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada, John Colborn, was approached by the Black Colonization Society and asked if they could emigrate. He famously said, quote, Tell the Republicans on your side of the line that we royalists do not know men by their color. End quote. They were officially welcomed. About 35 families settled before the landowning company stopped the program so as not to offend public feeling. It wasn't exactly rosy once the families had settled. Not everyone was as forward-thinking as the lieutenant governor. Among other nasty tactics, including racist local residents burning down black farmers' barns, most of the black families were driven out. Sure, it was better for black people in Canada, but the majority of white folks back then, while being anti-slavery, were still racist to the point that they did not want black neighbors. Eventually, many, but not all, of the Wilberforce settlers moved back to Ohio once the white folks there realized that there was a shortage of labor, and they relaxed their draconian laws to a degree. The families also moved to other communities in Ontario. Bidolph Township, where James and Johanna Donnelly would settle, is currently just about 25 minutes north of London, Ontario, by car. In those days, it would take a lot longer to cover the distance on dirt paths and roads on foot and on horseback. 
the area became a favored place for the Irish settlers to live. The London area, as it was considered better farming lands, went to the ruling English and Scots. The Irish got the second-rate land in Bidolf, near the town we now call Lucan, which was called Mary's Town at the time until around 1860. But that land was still way better than they had back in Ireland. Many of the early Irish settlers were Protestant, but during the 1840s, more Catholics fled Ireland and settled there. James arrived first, and Joanna and their son James Jr. arrived later in 1842. Their second son, William Donnelly, was born in 1844. With a growing family, the Donnellys wanted to expand their land, and during this time, they settled on Lot 10, Concession 6. The Concession 6 road became known as the Roman Line due to the number of Roman Catholics that settled there, and it still carries that name. Johanna and James were very hard workers. The lot was just thick forest when they arrived. They spent the next number of years building a house, clearing the land, and making it a successful farm. There was no Netflix back then, so in their free time they had sex, lots of it. Between 1844 and 1854, they added five more boys to their family, John, Patrick, Michael, Robert, and Thomas, with the eldest, James Jr., and William. That made seven boys in total. These boys would become a formidable force in the community over time. They were, by most accounts, handsome, sturdy lads who did well for themselves in business. They also inherited the code of their ancestors in Ireland. They embodied their ancestors' war cry, On to Victory, and lived the motto, Brave and Loyal. It's said that if the Donnellys were your friends, they were the most loyal friends you could find. But if they were your enemy, watch out. All seemed to be going well for the Donnellys up to this point, but this is where things started to go wrong. You see, it turns out that Lot 10 on Concession 6 wasn't theirs to settle. They had just decided to take it over. They were squatters. This seems totally outrageous today, but back in the early days of Canada, this wasn't that uncommon. In 1855, the absentee landowner, John Grace, sold 50 acres of the land to a man named Michael Mayer for $200. When Mayer arrived to check on his new purchase, he found the Donnellys living there and farming it. Mayer paid them a visit to tell them to leave, a fight broke out, and he was sent away. Not long after this incident, a man named Patrick Farrell, a family member of one of the white boys' family back in Tipperary, was on the property arguing with the Donnellys about the land dispute when James Donnelly shot in his general direction to get him to leave. James was charged for the shooting but didn't go to jail. In 1866, the family was hauled into court, being sued to get off the land. We found the court document from the University of Western Ontario. It reads in part, quote, Court of Common Pleas, ejectment notice for James Donnelly from John Grace, 1856, in the Court of Common Pleas, County of Huron, to wit, the 26th day of May, A.D., 1856, a writ of summons in ejectment for John Grace of the Township of London in the County of Middlesex against James Donnelly of the Township Bidolph in the County of Huron to recover possession of the north half of lot number 18 in the Sixth Concession of the Township Bidolph in the County of Huron, one of the United Counties of Huron and Bruce. J.W. Nelson, Plaintiff's Attorney. Ain't legalese fun. The Donnellys put forth in defense the facts that they had worked the land from wild forest to a home and successful farm over a number of years, and they were raising seven boys there. So the judge, seeing what they had done, split the land, giving half to the Donnellys and the other half to Mayer. By trying to keep both parties happy, the judge made neither of them happy, and the resentments grew. And we'll take a break right here. And we are back. Uh, Matthew, what are your thoughts so far on this episode that you wrote? <laughs> yeah. I think, first of all, I think it's very well written. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just joking. Yeah, I, you know, when I was writing this, I just found it's, it was just so fascinating to, to learn about Irish immigration and mm -hmm. early Canadian history. Um, you know, my family were actually Scots that, you know, got the better part, the better land, if you will. Sure. Or the early settlers in Canada, you know, it was not for the faint of heart. No, it definitely was right? not. It, it, yeah. I mean, it was a struggle. It was, the, it was the wild west. It was rough going. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it really was. And, you know, because there's no infrastructure. No. Uh, you need, you want to live? 
do it yourself. Make yeah. everything yourself. And, uh, you know, I'm busy complaining about, uh, you know, my skip the dishes order is not exactly on time. <laughs> Meanwhile, you need to remove tree stumps in order to cultivate land to get food. Yeah. You have to think about where am I going to poo? Yeah. Like really, <laughs> it's, it, there's a lot of things. The bad feelings boiled over at a logging bee. No, not a sewing bee, but similar. A logging bee is when members of the community would come together to clear land. Often, and in this case, the workers at a bee were paid with lots of alcohol. As the day went on during this particular logging bee, the booze flowed. Patrick Farrell started a fight with James Donnelly Sr. The fight went on for about 20 minutes until James Donnelly picked up a handspike a wooden rod, often with a metal end used for prying or leverage, and hit Farrell on the head. A few days later, he died of his injuries. Many people at the scene said that it was, effectively, self-defense. A warrant for James' arrest was issued, but James went into hiding. He knew the forest near his homestead well and hid out for well over a year to evade capture. Joanna was harassed many times, saying that she was helping a fugitive, but she maintained she did not know where her husband was. Interestingly, during this time, the neighbors said that a rather burly woman wearing a dress and bonnet was often seen working the land. You know, another hint that perhaps he was around was that at this time, Joanna became visibly pregnant. Um, oh, at, that's a big hint that there's a man <laughs> at, around. At the time of, with, with their first daughter. First okay. only daughter, yeah. Ah. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, she, you know, he was gone for a year and she was pregnant, so. <laughs> ah, yeah. could have been somebody else. Could have been. Right, <laughs> yeah. Joanna didn't want her husband to live this way, constantly in hiding. She needed him full time on the farm, so she talked him into turning himself in. She was sure that he'd get a few years for manslaughter and eventually be back with the family where he belonged. So James turned himself into authorities. However, to Joanna's horror, he was charged with first-degree murder and sentenced to death. Joanna and others started a petition to get his sentence commuted. Joanna spent many mornings on the Catholic Church steps appealing for people to sign the petition. Eventually, she had his sentence changed to manslaughter, and James Sr. spent the next seven years in jail. During these seven years, Joanna somehow managed to keep the farm going. She also taught her boys to fight. They were poor. They were Donnelly's and their father was in jail. So she taught the boys not to take crap from anyone. They grew up as hard-working, hard-drinking, strong young men. The pack of boys were a formidable force in the area. You know, Joanna, I, I find actually the most interesting character in this story. Why do you find her so interesting? She held it all together. She taught the boys to fight. Um, there's when I was doing the research, we didn't. I did, there's so much I didn't put in here. Like she is arrested for cursing at a man, right? She was oh wow. A, she's accused of witchcraft. She what a horrible woman. She cursed uh, at a man, and and you know she did things like, you know, when her husband was in jail, she sold a small plot of their land. So school could be built so that with the deal that the boys could go to the school, so they're actually educated. Oh, wow. Uh, and she managed to remortgage the land. She mm -hmm. did a lot of stuff. She held it together. Well, I guess that's a big part of, like you mentioned earlier, um, we didn't really have, we don't have to think about those things today. Yeah. But when you're starting out and there is no community, you have to build it yourself. Yeah. And she was, she was a force of nature. She yeah. was not a shrinking violet. And, you know, imagine how women were treated back then. And mm -hmm. she, she just rolled up her sleeve and sleeves and made it happen. I, I think perhaps there was a lot more expectation on a, a woman to be more physical in, probably. in that yeah, era. You're probably right. Yeah. yeah. I, I think they were still treated more like property than, yeah. yeah. Than a Couldn't partner. vote, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. But yeah, I just found her fascinating. I, you know, to me, she's, um, she was the most fascinating character in all of this. The boys grew up, and in 1873, four of the brothers started a stagecoach business that ran from Exeter to London. Soon, other stagecoach companies started up, including the Flanagan's Company, which would become the Donnelly's main rivals. This created a rivalry that ended up with fights between stagecoach drivers stagecoaches being destroyed and barns being burnt down. The 1870s was dubbed the Reign of Terror, 
a time in Lucan's history when crime was an epidemic. Barnes hotels and stagecoach businesses were set on fire. There is evidence that shows that the Donnellys became the community scapegoat for anything that happened. If a neighbor had a grudge with another neighbor, they would burn down their buildings and spread the rumor that it must have been those Donnellys. If anything went wrong on a white boy's farm, a Blackfoot was usually blamed, and the Donnellys, being the best known and most problematic Blackfoot family, ended up constantly blamed for almost everything that went wrong in the area. Yeah, it's one of these things, right? So they were they were accused of witchcraft. They're accused of poisoning animals, even mm-hmm. though theirs are poisoned as well. Sure, you know, sure, these boys were absolutely no angels, but probably not as evil as they're portrayed to be. There's one quote that I read when one of the surviving boys was seen on the street and a woman ex- exclaimed, "But he's so small, I expected him to be a giant." Mm. You know, there's there's this this whole uh, thing happened that made the Donnellys to be these big sort of larger than life characters. Larger than life characters that in the community's mind were evil. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but they, you know, everyone was just everyone was on everyone back then. Yeah. But it was a point of you know him having gone to jail the fact that they're black feet and would trade with protestants and that there are you know seven boys it just sort of culminated into this you know they're the evil ones and and the ills of all society isn't it funny how people can have wrong ideas about other people every small town every big every the big world city, but you know yeah. small town communities mm. there's always one family that becomes becomes sort of the almost a uh, scapegoat or you know the example beyond what they've the family had maybe ever done wrong of, of what you don't want to be sure they're a good example of a bad example yeah yeah, yeah. and in, in even though half of it's not true their hometown of tipperary was considered the unruliest and most crime ridden at the time lucan mirrored this and was considered the roughest place in ontario to live In 1877, James Jr. died, some say from sickness, others say it was from a gunshot wound. The facts of his death seem to be lost to history. In 1879, Michael Donnelly, who was trying to stop a man named William Lewis from abusing a dog in Waterford, Ontario, was stabbed to death by that man. He was only 29 years old. Now only five Donnelly boys were left. It's important to note that by this time, William Donnelly had married the sister of white boy John Kennedy, who hated him for it. James Jr. and Michael are already dead. Patrick and Robert had both moved out of the area. James Carroll, descendant of the white boy killed in the Tipperary massacre we mentioned at the beginning of the show, was stated enemy of the Donnellys, and he was made constable of the area at the time. That same year, Father John Connolly arrived in Biddulph as the new priest of the St. Patrick's Roman Catholic Church. He had it out for the Blackfoot Donnelly family and even started preaching in the pulpit about the evil Donnellys that he was going to drive out of the community. He eventually announced the formation of a peace society to stop the epidemic of crime in the area, but in reality, it was a vigilante group of white boys, a group of anti-Donnellys, banded together for the sole purpose to do something about the Donnellys. It was headed up by James Carroll, the police officer. Exhibit H in a later trial was the priest's petition. It read, quote, We the undersigned Roman Catholics of St. Patrick's Bidolph solemnly pledge ourselves to aid our spiritual advisor and parish priest in the discovery and putting down of crime. Our mission, while we at the same time protest as Irish and as Catholics against any interference with him, in legitimate discharge of the spiritual duties, end quote. Joanna was becoming afraid, and she likened this gang to the white boys back in Ireland, which, in fact, was exactly what they were. William Donnelly started to realize the danger he and his family were in and wrote to the priest to try and have a fair hearing. The priest's response was to increase the rhetoric, openly denouncing William from the pulpit. Emboldened by Father Connolly's violent sermons, on the night of the 3rd of February, 1882, the Vigilance Committee had a meeting and started drinking, eventually deciding to do something once and for all about those Donnellys. A group of men with hatchets, clubs, and guns 
quietly made their way in the cold, bright winter night to the Donnelly homestead. Some people say it was up to a total of 40 people in the mob. According to DonnellyMuseum.com, quote, Just before bed on the night of February 3rd, the Donnellys were enjoying apples after a late supper. John Donnelly went to Will's home in Whalen Corners and decided to stay the night. Later in the evening, the household began to retire. James Sr. and Johnny in one bedroom, Johanna and Bridget, a niece visiting from Ireland, in the other bedroom, and Tom in his room off the kitchen. Under the cover of darkness, the vigilantes surrounded the house. James Carroll, who was the ringleader, led the intrusion, entering the house alone, and handcuffed Tom, end quote. From the written witness statement of young Johnny O'Connor, one man entered the farmhouse with a candle, snuck into the room of sleeping Tom Donnelly, the strongest Donnelly, and handcuffed him so he couldn't defend himself or the family. The intruder woke up John Sr., who went to the bed that Johnny was in to get his coat, which Johnny was using as a pillow. The intruder pulled the coat from under Johnny's head and quickly covered him with a quilt so the young boy couldn't get a look at the interloper. The intruder then ordered the rest of the family and the now handcuffed Tom into the kitchen. Johnny hid as this was happening. The family didn't know that a large mob was outside circling the home like a pack of wolves. The man then yelled, signaling the men outside who stormed in with their deadly weapons. Johnny's hiding spot was under the bed behind a clothes basket, listening as the lynch mob attacked the Donnellys. Tom, though handcuffed, fought his way outside of the house, but he was caught, beaten and stabbed with a pitchfork, then dragged back in, kicking and screaming. From young Johnny's account, quote, I heard them throw him down on the floor. Then the fellow hit him three or four whacks with a spade. I peeked out. I just looked out and immediately drew my head back, end quote. By the time it was all over, everyone in the house was slaughtered, except for young Johnny, who the mob didn't see. You know, there is one part that when I wrote this, I left out, but I'm going to mention it now. Joanna got on her knees and was praying. Oh, dear. And um, one of the, Johnny heard one of the killers say that praying, time for praying is over and killed her while she is mid prayer. Oh, man. Yeah. That's, hor that's horrendous. I know. After doing their evil work, the mob spread coal oil on the dead and dying and threw out the house and set it on fire as they left. Young Johnny said that at this point, I got out from under the bed. I went to the front room and saw Tom dead on the floor. Then I ran to the kitchen. The old woman was lying between the door and the front room and to the kitchen. The next day, when police examined the scene, these are indeed where the two bodies were found. When he got out of the burning building, Johnny ran to the Whalen family home nearby. He pounded on the door. They let him in and wrapped Johnny in a blanket. Shaking, Johnny told them what had happened and that he recognized people in the mob. But the Whalens told him to be quiet, not to say anything to anyone, or he and they could be in trouble with the dangerous mob. While Johnny was telling his story to the Whalens, the mob, not having quite yet wiped out the entire Donnelly family, made their way up the Roman line to William Donnelly's homestead. There, William was sleeping with his wife, Nora. His brother, John, and his friend, Martin Hogan, were asleep in another room. The mob started yelling out his name. John Donnelly was the first to wake up and ran through the room. William heard him and woke up. From court transcripts, William stated, quote, I heard John run through the room and into the kitchen. I heard them, by them he means the mob, yell, fire, fire, open the door, Will, then heard two shots in a rapid succession. John fell back. I heard his head strike, end quote. William Donnelly ran to the window to peek through the curtains. Hogan said to Will, stay hidden. They think they killed you, and if they find out you're still alive, they'll come back and kill us all. There was a lot of debate about how the mob mistook John for William. However, in 2005, forensic experts recreated the scenario with a replica of the gun and compared the size of the wound in an autopsy report and concluded that the shooter was about 17 feet or 5.18 meters away and that perhaps with the darkness, and John standing just inside the door of a dark house, this is why they thought it was William. It was me they wanted, and it was me they thought they'd shot. John was choking with blood. The missus got a piece of blessed candle, and Hogan held it in John's hand until he died. Thinking they had shot Will, 
whom they saw as the leader of the Donnellys, the mob left believing they had succeeded in their mission. Brave Johnny, fearing for his life, still got the strength to come forward and name names. He said that the first person in the house was Constable James Carroll, the local lawman and leader of the Peace Society. Others implicated in the massacre were Thomas Ryder, John Pertell, Martin McLaughlin, John Kennedy, brother-in-law of William, and James Ryder. William Donnelly also stated that when he looked out the window, he recognized three men. I saw John Kennedy, James Carroll, and James Ryder. These persons are well known to me. The day of the murders, February 4th, 1880, Thomas Hossack, the local coroner, gathered a jury to conduct an inquest into the suspicious death of the Donnellys. The purpose of the coroner's inquest was to determine if a crime had been in fact committed and to possibly implicate a person or persons in the crime. A variety of people testified, including Johnny O'Connor, who claimed to have witnessed the murders, and Pat Whalen, who lived across from the Donnelly farm. The inquest took place on three occasions, February 4th, 11th, and March 12th. In the end, the inquest determined that the crime of murder had taken place, but that persons unknown had killed the Donnellys. Regardless, local justice officials arrested 13 men in connection with the murder, including Constable James Carroll. The community, however, closed ranks, some out of loyalty to the killers, some through fear of being next. From McLean's Magazine in 1950, Two days after the massacre, Father Connolly preached the sermon at the mass funeral held in his own church in Lucan. He had stated in interviews that he was mortally afraid of son William and believed that William would do all in his power to have him arrested for murder. He feared that the fact that he had organized the vigilance committee made him just as liable to prosecution as any of the actual murderers. Father Connolly was never arrested for murder or anything else, but on the strength of what William Donnelly his wife and John O'Connor said they saw and heard 13 men were arrested and charged with multiple murders. But ultimately, the whole massacre was to be pinned on the shoulders of one man. In October 1880, in London, Ontario, the trial started with only Constable James Carroll being charged and brought to trial for his involvement in the murders. The first trial, which took place from the 4th of October to the 9th, 1880, was a spectacle inundated with press from the USA and Canada, and had a level of interest that rivaled the assassination of Lincoln at the time. If eyewitnesses were to be believed as many as 30 people, many pillars of the community could be put away if anyone broke ranks and started the domino effect of confessions. Six men would have been hanged. If they were convicted, about 30 others would have been charged. There was worry that it would wipe out the town with most of the men hanged or in jail. The trial ended in a hung jury, speaking of hanged. After deliberating for four and a half hours on the evening of October 9th, the judge addressed the court. He said, quote, The jury have sent a message to say that they cannot agree and they are not likely to agree. In a case of this kind, if there is no chance of their conscientiously coming to an agreement, I would not be inclined to keep them there to convince any one of them who conscientiously may have a view one way or the other. That was that, and that trial was over. After the first trial failed to bring a definitive conclusion as to the guilt of the accused, preparations began to hold a second trial. Crown Attorney Charles Hutchinson indicated in several letters to colleagues that he was feeling discouraged, that he would not get a conviction, and that the first trial and the upcoming second trial were, quote, a waste of time and money. He knew that the majority of residents in Middlesex County actively hated the Donnelly family and would do what they could to see that Carroll was not punished for something they saw as just, especially as he might hang if found guilty. In the second trial, which began in late January of 1881, all the testimony given was consistent with what had already been presented in the first trial. There was no new evidence of any significance presented, but it was no less dramatic. Twelve-year-old Johnny O'Connor, a witness to the events, took the witness stand and was questioned for two and a half hours about his narrow escape from the Donnelly cabin immediately after the mob left the house. His harrowing testimony indicated he'd witnessed a group of men, including Carol, the accused, using clubs and brutally hammering on Bridget Donnelly. 
After the testimony finished, for the second time on February 3, 1881, the judge gave his charge to the jury. He said, quote, If by the evidence of John O'Connor you are convinced that the prisoner James Carroll is guilty, then it is your duty to record a verdict in accordance with those facts. If, on the other hand, after all you have heard, and as reasonable men and true, you think there would not be sufficient evidence to warrant the conviction of the prisoner, then you will record a verdict in accordance with such a view of the case. You will now retire and deliberate on your verdict, and when you have arrived at the same, you will return to the court again. End quote. From the London Advisor. Almost exactly a year after the mass and just over four hours of deliberation, quote, the jury came in at eight minutes past three o'clock and after taking their seats were asked by Colonel Macbeth amid the most breathless silence, Gentlemen of the jury, have you agreed on your verdict? The foreman answered, We have. Colonel Macbeth asked, How do you find the prisoner, guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. The announcement was received by a tremendous burst of applause, which was kept up for some time. Notwithstanding the thundering voice of the high constable roaring, Silence! When Carroll came in, he was white as a sheet. It was almost a concluded fact by many in the court that an unfavorable verdict would be returned, and that the prisoner doubtless felt the emergency. Although people in Middlesex County may have felt justice of a sort had been served, others were not so sure. From the Listowel Banner on February 4th, 1881, Quote, that the jury have rendered a just verdict, many will no doubt call in question, but whatever may be the difference of opinion in this regard, we have a right to assume that it has been given by men who, with a full sense of their responsibilities, were sworn to deal justly between the Crown and the prisoners according to the evidence laid before them. With Carroll found not guilty, he was released, and the charges were dropped against everybody else. Officially, the Donnellys were killed by, quote, parties unknown. How does this happen? It's a travesty. Yeah. It really is. So they went after an entire family. Mm -hmm. All those people killed and nobody is being held accountable. No, no one at all. Nobody. I mean, everybody knows who did it. Yeah. Everyone seems to know who did it. But, you know, when you, when you have um, society who are in, involved, when you have the priest, when you have the constable, right? Yeah. It's, um, they, they, they circled their wagons. That was one of the most disturbing things to me about this whole story was the priest who said, yeah, it's, I'm done with these people. I've tried to reform them. I've tried to give them every chance to change and they won't do it. So we might as well go after them now. Yeah. Like he, he was actually the ring leader, it seems, yeah. Yeah. of this whole thing. And, you know, he, I don't know how much of it was because they were Blackfeet versus Whitefoot, right? And, and. Right. Um, but those, you know, those resentments in those camps had carried over from, from Tipperary. Yeah. 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 It's, it's amazing. I mean, we're, we're seeing a lot of that right now on the planet. Lots of people are just scrapping with, with each other over various and sundry things. Anyway, it's, it's all sectarian, e even outside of religion, it's sectarian, right? Mm -hmm. Of, of slightly different beliefs or nuances of beliefs. Sure. And everyone's like yeah. fighting and forgetting. Yeah. Generally. We're in the same boat together and generally we want to move forward together, right? <laughs> right. It's, a, it's, it's, yeah, the political divisions in the world right now are, are interesting and scary, frankly. I, I really, I, I really think we should be starting the peace movement again. Like let's, <laughs> let's, let's, uh, let's, um, I ask, the, I, ask Yoko to give us John Lennon's ashes and hold them up. I can and, supply the weed. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I don't want to do that necessarily, but. The Donnelly Massacre had been a political hot potato. The government didn't want to destroy the community, and many felt that a guilty verdict would have led to further violence in Bidolf anyway. Many were relieved that it ended the way it did. William Donnelly never gave up trying to get justice. He wrote an open letter to the Exeter Times in 1893. Quote, if any one of the living vigilantes can look back, you must come to the conclusion that retributive justice has been busy at work and that the cold, relentless hand of death is almost on his own shoulder. In 13 years, 32 persons who were either directly or indirectly involved in the slaughter have met their just deserts. 
Several were killed by the London, Huron, and Bruce train. More were found dead in bed without any cause of death. More fell in a well. More dropped dead. More died suffering the agonies of a mad dog, and a few were sent to the asylum, while a majority of those living are homeless and not worth a dollar, although well off, 13 years ago. Some of the broken and wasted bones of my family are still in my possession and will be until justice is fully done. William died on March 7, 1897. A massive tombstone was erected by the remaining family in 1889, listing the names of the victims with the word murdered under them. It sat on the site for 75 years when, in 1964, the parish priest ordered it removed due to unwanted attention. Donnelly descendants heard that the tombstone had been removed and approached the Catholic Church, who denied its removal. They had to seek legal counsel, at which time the Catholic Church finally admitted under oath that they were storing the tombstone in a barn by the church. The tombstone was given to William Donnelly's grandson, William Lord. The family erected a new tombstone, but without the accusing words murdered, under the names of the five dead. After Lord died, his widow, when asked about its whereabouts, said that it was buried and it was the wish of the family that it never be returned to Lucan. Today, the community has finally recognized the massacre as part of their history and heritage. They've opened up a Donnelly Museum that you can visit. Have you visited that museum? No, but after writing this episode, I really want to go. Yeah, I want to go too. I, I think it would be a really fascinating thing. And I'm sure there's still people in the community. I guarantee it. There are still people in the community who are like, nope, those people were bad people probably, and deserve to die. Probably. Yeah. And sort of the, when I was young, you know, I grew up in Strathroy, mm -hmm. which is further um, into the English Scottish area than London. Right. And even in the 70s and 80s, Lucan was Strathroy's nemesis with uh, hockey and everything else. It, um, I don't know. I, I don't know how much of all of this carried over into that, but... Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. And that's it for episode 208, The Donnelly Family Massacre. Ooh. Anyway. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> time to move on to voicemails. Voicemails. That's right. It's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at 1-877-327-5786 or 1-877-DARK-PTN. We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. Well, why don't we listen to our first voicemail? Let's do that. Hey, Mike and Matthew. This is Mia calling from Thunder Bay, uh, the district, not the city. I'm going to be getting like really sappy for a second. So through some background, I've been listening since grade nine. And I'm graduating this year, which is really weird for me. Um, every year, the show has been getting better. And when Matthew joined, I was, like, absolutely pumped. Not only is he a kick-ass co-host, but hearing about a fellow member of the LGBTQ plus community be so happy and, success and successful makes me feel hopeful for when I'm no longer a kid. <laughs> um, Keep up the good work. Thanks for everything. Go take a shit in your hat. <laughs> wow. Are you old enough to say go shit in my hat? Uh, I mm -hmm. love that. Thank That's you. That's great. That that means a lot to me, actually. It, it means a lot to both of us. And uh, the fact that somebody has been listening to this show uh, through some formative years is really interesting. Yeah. I, I, I don't usually think about... Uh, Teens listening to the show. And especially teens that are in my community and, you know, growing up in a small community, mm -hmm. sometimes I need to hear, it gets better. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I know? know it was, I know it was particularly rough in uh, the community that I grew up in because we were very ignorant. Dude, Strathra in the seventies. Oh my God. Yeah. A uh, lot filled with lots of great people now, Strathra. I'll have, I'll have to say that like, you know, people have moved on as well. Yeah, th it's like that back in Bridgewater yeah. too. There, there is much more uh, diversity there than there was when I was growing up. Whenever I hear Thunder Bay, I want to go Thunder, Thunder, Thunder Bay. Remember Thundercats? I do. I remember <laughs> Thundercats. Thank you for your call. Thank you so much. Let's listen to another one. Oh, there's a bunch this week. Hey, Mike and Matt. This is Brianne Sanford from Independence, Kansas. Um, I just recently joined Patreon, but I'm a long-time listener. I have to say that uh, your uh, 
idea of what my job was was terrific. I tell you what, it may take all day long to raise that flag, but I like to make sure that they're nice and erect. <laughs> I just want to say that your guys' podcast, Mike, is the best that I've listened to and really, honestly, the only one that I listen to. Oh, oh. And I've got my kids addicted to it as well. <laughs> I just want to say thank you again and go shit in your hat. Thank you. <laughs> thank great. you. Her voice is like butter. Yeah, that, she's that our is, she's that, our flag flag raiser from Independence, Kansas. She could do podcasts or radio. She's yeah, she's voice. got a good voice. Yeah, yeah. really good voice. You should be uh, superstar. doing your own podcast. <laughs> yeah, superstar. superstar. You're a superstar. <laughs> exactly. And uh, I think we have one more. So yeah, that makes many three. Anyway, here we go. Hey guys, my name's Sarah. I live in Minnesota. I was just listening to the case of Matthew Charles Lamb again um, because there was just so much in it. I had I don't think I fully listened the first time, but the stigma surrounding adoption, it is something that I've dealt with a lot, and I just want to thank you guys for being so um, having so much conviction on the topic because it's something I was bullied with, I was teased with, if someone got mad at me, you know, it was something they threw in my face. Luckily, my younger sister would always come to my defense and be like, hey, you know what? Our parents chose us. Your parents had, didn't get to choose you. So, I don't know. This is rambling. I'm so sorry. Have a good night. Thank you for all you do. <laughs> no, that's great. No, I, I remember, you know, things like that and, uh, Growing up, I, I think I said it in that episode, I was told that my parents weren't my real parents, you know? And it's like every time you hear there's a true crime case yeah. on TV or on the news or anything, if um, uh, a father murders a, a child, yeah, the adopted child was murdered. No, it was, it's just your child. It, it, this is one of those things, like there's, I don't understand a lot. Um, why does it happen? Like, it's, I don't understand a lot with people, but like the whole like adopted thing. It's like saying they were tall. It, it was, I it just, I've. Why do you have to say that? It to doesn't. me, it's the most bizarre thing that, mm -hmm. that people give a shit. Right. And I like what she says. Well, I was chosen yeah. mofo. I, I also, whenever I hear where somebody from, is from Minnesota, I always <laughs> think St. Cloud because it sounds like such a pretty place. Well, I think of, uh, isn't, uh. Uh, Rose Nyland from Minnesota. Oh yeah, Rose yeah. was yeah. She? Betty White. Oh, oh, Betty. Rest in peace, Betty. Yeah, she was a she was a kind soul. She was a class act. Yeah, really funny lady. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's it for voicemails. That's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at one eight seven seven three two seven five seven eight six or one eight seven seven D A R K P T N. We'd love to hear from you even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. So our first patron this week... We love patrons. ...signed up on Valentine's Day. Oh. Sean Patrick Kelly. That from, means Sean really loves us. From Norwich, Ontario. Norwich. Norwich, yeah. Norwich, Ontario. Yeah, so um, that's great. So what Thank does you. Sean do... In Norwich, Ontario, Matthew. Okay. Um, so what does Sean do there in Norwich, Ontario? I think he is an independent brewmaster. Oh, haven't we had one of those before? No. Oh, okay. So what does he independently brew? Tea? The beers. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a teetotaler, so I think tea automatically. Yeah. I don't think about beer anymore. Beer was never really my thing. No, me neither. Well, it was... It was kind of the thing that got me to the thing. Okay. If you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. It was it was the thing that got me through until I could actually get the thing. So I think he's a brewmaster. Oh, okay. And he's done some uh he also spoke to the people that set up the uh Donnelly the Donnelly craft beer. Oh, interesting. Um, and he advised them on how to do it. Oh, nice, very yeah. nice. Yeah. There's even a tragically hip brewing company now, apparently. So what do you mean, Cy? You don't like the hip? I don't know them, and everyone always talks about them. I love the Tragically Hip. Gord Downey was awesome. And, yeah, 
very active. He I know a, they had a song called Three Pistols only because I'm working with a company that's located in Trois Pistoles, which is Three Pistols. Sure. Quebec, yeah. There you go. Next, we have also a Valentine's Day patron, Natalie Walker, and she is from Morganton, North Carolina. She's from North Carolina. Hello, Natalie Walker. And what does Natalie do there in NC? She does nothing because she's an heiress to the Johnny Walker fortune. Wow. Yeah. Keep, wow. Keep walking, Natalie. Keep yeah. walking. Keep walking. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> this this you... is all alcohol inspired. I don't know where I'm getting this from. <laughs> well, are you, did you work for Johnny Walker at any point? Or? I, I did the global marketing for oh, Johnny okay. Walker. Well, there you go. So, Matthew, this is Matthew's brain. <laughs> Matthew's brain on alcohol. <laughs> oh, boy. No, I don't want to see that. No, no, no. Uh, next we have, I don't know where she's from, but her name is Carla Harvey. Carla? Mm-hmm. Carla's from Lucan, where the story took place. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, and she works at the Donnelly Museum. Well, good for her. Yeah. Is she sort of the curator there, or is she... Uh, somebody who shows people around, gives the tours. She's a historian. Oh, nice. Yep. Well, thank you, Carla. We need more historians. Thanks for all your help on the episode. Yeah, we appreciate that. <laughs> uh, next, we have Frankie and Dave. Frankie and Dave. Frankie and Dave are from Cardinal, Ontario. Okay. Yeah, so Cardinal, like the bird. Oh, I, th I, I immediately went to... The Pope. <laughs> Yeah, ab <laughs> yeah, like above a. Uh, what, what's the cardinal? Is like above a priest, below the pope. It's below the pope and yeah. above a priest. Yeah, and, but above an archbishop as well. Okay. Yeah. So. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. So they live in Cardinal Ontario. Yes. They do bird watching tours. Well, there you go. Um. Yeah. What kind of birds do they look at there specifically? Um, blue jays. Oh, there you go. <laughs> the Toronto Blue Jays. Oh, no. Is that not a hockey team? That's a baseball team, oh, okay. Matthew. And next we have uh, Julie Butler. But I don't know where Julie is from. Julie Butler. Where would she be from? Julie? Yeah. You don't know where Julie's from? No, I don't. I've been trying to figure it out, but I know you're going to tell me. <laughs> She's from Longview. Longview? Yeah. In Oregon? Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, wow. I, I knew there's a couple of places named Longview, but why why Longview, Oregon? What's going on there? What does she do there? She just enjoys the view. <laughs> it's a really long view. Yeah, she's friend, <laughs> she's friends with Natalie Walker, the heiress. Mm -hmm. Kind of just pays her way. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> You're very lazy today. <laughs> Matthew doesn't want to come up with anything. Hey, today. I'm coming up with great shit. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. <laughs> Wow. So I don't know what, what on earth we're going to have to do to... Uh, just so everyone knows, I just make this stuff up as it comes in. So Yeah, like people think we sit down and we plan yeah, this I'm out. Like, I'm like, oh no, we have like five people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, yay, we have five people, but I have to, <laughs> you have to figure out what they do for a living. <laughs> exactly. We did have... Wow, we had a whole bunch of patrons, this, or we had a whole bunch of donut money oh, donors this God. week. Thank uh, God. From Danny Custom Creations, Ooh. we have, enjoy your Tims from a Canadian who listens from England. I listen to you guys while I craft. You can find me in the craft barn. Cheers, Danielle. Wow. That's great. I, I love it when our uh, Facebook group folks yeah. sort of arrive and do something like and that. I, That's... I, always, I love it when UK people write in as well. Me too. I miss home. Well... I have never been. I would like to travel there. I am thinking about, I'm really seriously thinking about CrimeCon there in June. I have to, hey, you know what? What? Justin and I are going to visit family in the summer. Maybe we could wing both trips at the same time and I can do part of the family trip and CrimeCon. Let's see if we can work that out. Okay. Next, we have Larry McDonald, and Larry is from Timberley, Nova Scotia, very close to where I grew up. Uh, Larry says, keep up the awesome work. Loved your book. Well, thank you, Larry, for Thanks, reading Larry. and buying, I presume, my book, or maybe getting it from the library. I still have to read it. You still, what? <laughs> oh, Jesus. Anyway, uh, so Larry, what does Larry do there in Timberley, uh, Nova Scotia? 
Logging. Logging. You would, one would assume. Yeah. One would assume that. You can't take the timber out of Timberly. Oh my gosh. <laughs> this bothers me. <laughs> yeah. And next we have, um, wow. Here's a donation from someone named Margo Montanian. Hi, Margo. She says, I love the Margo. She says, I love you, Matthew. I love you, Mike. And of course, I love you, Steve. Please get yourself a treat, boys, and let Steve pick a treat too. Your barnyard faithful Margo. Yeah. Uh, Margo's. I, we see her a lot in the Mar barnyard. Margo's great. Yeah. There's a core group of us, or there's a core group of people that put up with my shit memes. <laughs> right. Your memes are terrible. And I started up, uh, sort of revitalized our Discord server. I noticed you're in there as just your name, just Matthew. <laughs> yeah. I have to like re do the whole thing again. I'm so bad at technology. It's, it's okay. Uh, people will figure it out. What is Discord? Well, it's just a place for people to chat and hang oh, out. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah, it's like a chat server. And okay, so I started, but I have to like confirm my email so then I'll get in and do yeah. it. Yeah. Cool. So we can chat there um, either over text and I've made some audio channels and I'm thinking maybe we should start to do that for patrons as have chats on, on uh, Discord where both of us are logged in at the same time and we have a chitty chat. That'd be fun. Yeah, it would be. Okay, I'll finish uh, setting myself up. Yeah, so it's super simple. I put a bunch of rules in that, you know. Everyone if, will ignore. Every, if people ignore it, then they just get booted. <laughs> You'd, it's a privilege, not a right to Managing be. Managing groups of people is hard sometimes. It really is. People don't see how difficult it is <laughs> yeah. because I try to keep the, ma the management of the group uh, shouldn't be what the group is about. Yeah. So I quietly... Remove yeah. things. And, yeah, it's hard. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's just because we just don't want fighting. Yeah. And we've, I've got a, we've got a couple of mods who are helping us out. Great deal. We've got Hayes and, uh, when uh, you say that, Tanya, when you say mods, I picture like mods, like the, the, the fashion <laughs> style. <laughs> you're, you're thinking Quadrophenia mods. <laughs> mods. I love that movie, by the way. Such, such a good movie. So I'm just picturing mods like moderating for us. I watched Quadrophenia again. I should watch it again. A while ago. A little while ago. And it was so good. You know what I've watched recently? What's that? Uh, Inventing Anna. Now, I need to watch that because uh, I, I like that actor. She's in she uh, Ozark. Is, she's honest, she's Mike, great. She is, she is becoming quickly one of my favorite actresses. Mm -hmm. she, her range is incredible. She was also in The Americans, the, the okay. show that I just watched. She played uh, the daughter of a CIA Okay. Uh, executive. Yeah. So, um, and she was being romanced by this older man who was the yeah. spy. It's, it's, such, it's a good show. I mean, it, it really shines a light on how the rich, like, it doesn't matter if you have a good idea or not. It's mm. who you know. Oh my God. Yeah. And, um, there's one part though, the pit of my stomach. I, I was at a fancy restaurant once with a bunch of Wealthy people sure. with, with yep. expensive tastes and it was a very drunken night mm -hmm. and nobody meant to do it, but I got left with a 5,000 British pound bill for, oh the, my for God. the meal yeah. and I was panicking. I was like 25, right? What are you good? How, how are you? I had to that? call my credit card and get an extension and I didn't know what to do, but luckily mm. one of the women at the table, um, super rich woman, but not like just... The next morning, she's like, I have this weird feeling that you get got left holding because I didn't know how to approach people, right? Yeah. And uh, so she um, she had her driver bring me the cash the next day. <laughs> well, oh, I'm so sorry, Matthew, but I'll have my driver bring you 5,000 pounds. Actually, she was, she's Australian, so say that in Australian accent. Hello, nice lady. We'll have you bring over the driver. We'll bring over 5,000 pounds. Yeah, because there's a scene. Uh, I sounded more Kiwi. Yeah, there. there's a sport, spoiler alert where this woman, like, shafts a friend with a 60,000 pound hotel bill. The dollar, $60,000. It's, it's such a good show. Anyway, oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, well, I'll have to watch it. And thank you to all our patrons and donut money donors, past and present, for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You don't know how important that is right now. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash darkpoutine. 
For a one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal using our email, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it'd mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available for order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of our website, please check out darkpoutine.com for show notes and other cool stuff. Please take the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening and tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. And until we return, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Until we meet again. Bye. Bye.